Hi everyone. Today's study tip is to write a question mark in your notes or book next to items that are unclear. I've seen a lot of you doing this in class and I think it's really helpful because then you can go back and ask for help from the instructor or other students to clarify your questions. This lecture is about chapter 16 as part two of the respiratory system. So remember that gases are going to move from a high to low pressure. This was the basis of how we're going to have an inhalation. And we think about the actual composition of air. Air is about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a small amount of CO2 and water. Each gas has a partial pressure, so that all of them totals our 760 that we saw as being normal. Okay, so for example, nitrogen as a point is 78% of the air, so 0 0.78 times 760 makes the partial pressure of nitrogen 593. Gases also have a partial pressure in liquid. And for oxygen, if we take a calculation of partial pressure, we see that 0 0.21, 20% oxygen times 760, gives us 159.6 milligrams of mercury as the partial pressure of oxygen. And what about 2% CO2? 0.02 times 760 gives us 15.2 for partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So this is what the composition is then. When we think about all the different components of air, the total pressure being 760, what I want to point out here is that inspired air differs then from alveolar air. Okay, So what we find is that alveolar air gives us those concentrations we just talked about, 568, 105, 40, 47. Um, but in inspired air then, it's actually a lot more nitrogen, more oxygen, a very small amount of carbon dioxide, and the amount of water is variable. Whereas in the alveolar air, water is pretty high, CO2 is higher because that's what you are um, unloading from your tissues, oxygen is lower, and nitrogen is a little bit lower as well. But they're equivalent in terms of total pressure, just the partial pressures of gases differ. Okay, so why does this matter? This matters because this changes, these partial pressures changes as we go through different parts of the blood and for different gases in the blood. And so I wanted to move this down to show you, but I want you to memorize these values and remember that units are milligrams of mercury, millimeters of mercury, excuse me. Okay, so memorize the values here. Looking at capillaries and tissues. Okay, so here we are in, let's start here in the tissues. Okay, so in the tissues, we can start here with our partial pressure of oxygen being 40 partial pressure of CO2 being 46. And so that's what's traveling then through the systemic veins. The systemic veins then, the right atrium and ventricle pump that blood. And this is what comes from the pulmonary artery into the capillaries, okay? And at the alveoli around the capillaries, now you have exchange, okay? You have oxygen coming into the blood and CO2 leaving the blood. The alveoli, partial pressure of oxygen is 105. Partial pressure of CO2 is 40. Okay, let's look at oxygen first. When we're looking at 40 in the blood and 105 in the alveoli, that is going to allow oxygen to travel down its pressure gradient and move into the blood. Carbon dioxide is going to go the opposite, 46 to 40. It's going to move down its pressure gradient into the alveoli that you can then breathe it out. So now, entering the pulmonary veins, we have a partial pressure of oxygen of 100, and CO2 is 40. Okay. Then that blood is going to go to the left atrium and ventricle to be pumped to the systemic arteries. That's going to then match um, here too. And then in the tissues, what's happening? Well, it's getting highly oxygenated air, low amount of carbon dioxide. When it gets to tissues then, in the tissues, the partial pressure of oxygen is lower. So oxygen moves from the blood into tissues. The partial pressure of CO2 is higher in the tissues than it was in the blood. And so that CO2 then is going to be dumped into the blood moving down its pressure gradient, and then that can circulate back to the capillaries, which acts the alveoli, okay? So we essentially have two things happening here in order to actually oxygenate our tissues. We have oxygen entering from the alveoli into the capillaries, CO2 being dropped off, and then at the tissues, we have oxygen being dropped off and CO2 moving into the blood to then go back to the alveoli. So we're gonna talk about both of these instances here of transfer at the alveoli and in the tissues. Okay, so our basic principle here, gas moves from high to low. Gas diffusion in the lungs, CO2 diffuses from the capillary, which is 46, to the alveolus, which is 40. 
oxygen moves into the blood from the alveolus. In the tissues, it's the opposite. CO2 is using from the tissue to the capillary, and oxygen is diffusing from the capillary to the tissues. Gases are going to diffuse until they reach equilibrium or close to equilibrium. So we don't always get quite equilibrium, but we get close because it's based on diffusion, passive principle. It's going to move until equilibrium is reached. Okay, so how do we alter gas diffusion or when do we see gas diffusion being altered? Exercise is an instance that makes a really big difference. There's a large gradient then of high to low. Emphysema we see affecting gas diffusion, um, primarily because you have a decreased surface area for diffusion, which we talked about in the last lecture. Blood flow, we have ventilation perfusion coupling. So if ventilation is low and heart rate is too high, you get vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arterioles. This is going to slow blood moving past the lungs, allowing for gas diffusion. So this is a way for your body to increase gas diffusion by moving the blood more slowly past the lungs. And the opposite is also true. If ventilation is too high and heart rate is therefore low, um, uh, you get vasodilation of the pulmonary arterioles. Pulmonary edema can affect this. So fluid and mucus in the alveoli increases the distance for gas diffusion, making it more difficult. And altitude is a major one too. So we think about somewhere like Tahoe compared to San Jose. Tahoe is going to have less atmospheric pressure than San Jose does. And so we get changes in the high to low diffusion of gases. Okay. So fun fact here, the total surface area of the alveoli in both lungs is about the size of a tennis court. So if you reduce this, then you get reduced oxygen transfer into your tissues. Okay, let's think about a case study here. Sarah was very ill and her roommate noticed that Sarah was hypoventilating. Remember, hypo is going to mean lower or decreased. So hypoventilating is going to be slow, shallow breathing. There were even moments of apnea when her breathing temporarily stopped. So I want you to compare the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs of Sarah versus her roommate who was feeling fine. What effect will the gas exchange in Sarah's lungs have on the gas exchange in her tissues? Mm. Okay. So only about 1.5% of oxygen is dissolved in blood. The rest is carried by hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, remember, is four subunits. Each has a heme and an iron molecule. And normal heme contains iron in the reduced form. Okay, This is the form that allows oxygen to bind. So if he, we have heme differences, then we might have differences in this um, form here and might have problems with carrying oxygen. So here's what it looks like. There's two beta chains and two alpha chains. Each chain contains a heme group, so you see one, two, three, four, four heme groups contained in this hemoglobin molecule. Each one can carry a molecule of oxygen. Hemoglobin and oxygen together is called oxyhemoglobin. And when the oxygen comes off, the iron remains in the reduced form, and the hemoglobin is called reduced hemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin. Oxidized hemoglobin is when iron loses that hydrogen ion. This becomes methemoglobin, and it can't bind oxygen anymore. Carboxyhemoglobin is when CO2 binds instead of O2, and too much of this is toxic. This is what happens with carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. So looking at the oxygen content of blood, let's imagine a gas tank where we have the partial pressure of oxygen being 100. Okay. Um, when we get it diffused into the blood, we get partial pressure of oxygen in the plasma in the blood be 100 each, but because of the, the binding ability of oxyhemoglobin, then we get way more um, oxygen being able to be dissolved in whole blood than in plasma alone. Okay, so in terms of total oxygen content, the pressures are the same, okay, but the oxygen content differs. We can only get about um, 0.3 milliliters of oxygen dissolved into plasma, whereas your whole blood with the red blood cells can carry 20. Okay, so a much larger oxygen carrying capacity here than in the whole blood. So the oxygen bound in hemoglobin does not contribute to the pressure of blood. So that's why you can have the pressure being the same in the plasma and in whole blood. So in that figure I just showed you, the partial pressure of oxygen at 100 is 100 with or without the hemoglobin. However, the total oxygen content in the container with hemoglobin is much, much higher. Hemoglobin saturation, remember you need four per molecule to be saturated, 
is determined by this partial pressure of oxygen. So the higher partial pressure of oxygen you have, the increased hemoglobin saturation you have. And so what we end up with then, and we're going to use a lot in the next coming um, slides and next lecture as well, is this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So when we're reading this thing, I want you to notice this x-axis is our partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. The y-axis has two y-axes, actually. So on the left-hand side, there's percent oxyhemoglobin saturation. So it's going to be the amount of hemoglobin you have that is oxygenated. And oxygen content on the right-hand side. Okay. So what we see is that as partial pressure of oxygen increases, we see an increase in saturation. And this curve increases quickly until we get to this point here where it starts to still increase, but it decreases um, in terms of the severity of how fast it goes. So, right, so the slope is changing here versus here. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, two things I want to point out. One is that this is going to be the veins at rest. So your veins at rest have a round partial pressure of oxygen of 40. And that actually is this turning point here, the point where the slope goes from very steep to less steep, okay? The arteries are around 100, so they're way up here at the very top where you have 100% or almost 100% of oxyhemoglobin saturation is happening there too. And so the only difference then here between veins and arteries, this is the amount that can be unloaded to tissues, right? Because if your arteries are coming in at 100% and veins are at you know, 75, 80%, then you're only unloading that 20, 25% to tissues. Okay. Okay. So more about this. Uh, um, hemoglobin is almost completely saturated at 60 milligrams of mercury, millimeters of mercury. This is 40 less than normal. And so what that means is that hemoglobin is saturated even if breathing is wrong. So there's kind of this this push or this um, need for hemoglobin to be saturated. And unloading of oxygen at the tissues occurs at that steep portion of the curve. So this allows for 25% of oxygen to be dropped off in tissues, while hemoglobin is still 75% saturated in tissues normally. And so this gives us some flexibility because if we, you know, normally we're only getting 25% dropped off at tissues, but you need more, like in the case of exercise, well, you have more. You still have a bunch in your hemoglobin, okay? So if you need more um, oxygen, like during exercise, you can get more from these kinds of stores that are there in hemoglobin. Turns out that this association curve is affected by pH. So if we look at this, and I can't pull this up, but I wanted to show you. Um, okay, so effective pH on our oxyhemoglobin association curve. Note that this changes, okay? So here we are, blood 7.4. If blood becomes too acidic, it pushes that curve to the right. If blood gets too basic, it pushes that curve to the left. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what these mean and what these movements and effects of pH mean on this too. So remember that the unloading of tissue is going to change based on this curve shape. Okay. Let's think about an example where Stephen has bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, and this condition has always increased the resistance in his airways and therefore decreased plasma oxygen levels. So when the pressure of oxygen levels are not normal, the oxygen hemoglobin curve sh shifts slightly to the left or to the right. So I want you to think about which way his curve would shift. Compared to a healthy subject, does Stephen need hemoglobin to easily release oxygen? less saturation, or tightly hold oxygen, more saturation in his tissues. So I want you right now to draw the curve we would see in Stephen's blood. What's going to be happening here? Okay. So the shift in this curve is called the Bohr effect. When you get a shift to the right, it decreases hemoglobin saturation and increases oxygen unloading. Okay. So this will happen if you have an increase in the pressure of CO2, a decrease in pH, or an increase in temperature. You get decreased hemoglobin saturation and increased oxygen unloading. In a shift to the left, this happens if you have increased hemoglobin saturation and decreased oxygen unloading. And this will happen if you have a decrease in PCO2, an increase in pH, or a decrease in temperature. Okay, so we talk about left shifts as favoring um, hemoglobin saturation 
and right shifts as favoring oxygen unloading. Okay. Let's think about CO2 a little bit. We've got about 7% dissolved in plasma, 20% binding to hemoglobin to make carbamino hemoglobin, and 72% is converted into bicarbonate ions. And so that's going to be the focus of our next lecture. We talk about the buffering system in the blood, talking about this bicarbonate buffering system, which is this. So CO2 and, and, um, and water, bicarbonate, the right-hand side of this equation then is going to be hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. This is how we convert it. This is the buffer in our blood, right? Um, but we're converting CO2 constantly to these bicarbonate ions, and that makes up our blood buffering system. Okay? So this, medi this medium one here is called carbonic acid. Um, so sometimes it's called the carbonic acid buffering system or the bicarbonate buffering system in your blood. The enzyme for this reaction is called carbonic anhydrase. Okay, and again, we're going to focus a lot more on this next lecture. Okay, so um, since we're going to kind of move into acid base next time, I want to finish up this one talking about uh, the brainstem respiratory centers. So here's what's going to be controlling respiration. And remember, in your brain, this is going to be a cross section through the middle of your brain. Here's the hypothalamus, here's the midbrain, and here's the pons. Okay, and right next to the pons in the brainstem, you have three respiratory centers here. There's a pneumotaxic area, an apneustic area, and a rhythmicity area. Um, and then that's all above this medulla oblongata. So this rhythmicity area is almost down in the medulla. Chemoreceptors actually primarily measure arterial PCO2. Okay, so an increase of 5 um, millimeters causes an increase in respiratory rate. This is called hypercapnia. Alternately, a decrease in PCO2 causes a decrease in respiratory rate, and then you get hypocapnia. So remember, hyper is always going to mean increase. Hypo is going to mean low or decrease. You do get some senses of arterial PO2. There's receptors in the carotid bodies, um, but these are only triggered by very low PO2. So actually, most of your regulation then comes from this arterial PCO2 um, sensation. Okay. Um, but when you have very low PO2, that's sensed in the carotid bodies, and you respond with an increase in respiratory rate. There's also receptors for arterial pH, and um, when you have hydrogen ion, this stimulates an increase in respiratory rate. And so next time we're going to talk all about this, all about the buffering system, and all about how we regulate blood pH.